Chapter 6 Hammering Out the Differences The Tenth Light Day of Elimbu, 819 64 Days Until Sound Being in no hurry to see Feroth, I explore the great old forest. Rare is the tree that is less than a hundred years old. Often quoted elvish wisdom says that it takes an oak three hundred years to grow, three hundred years to stand, and three hundred years to die. Walking in this hallowed forest, I can see the evidence of that statement all around me. Farther in, a stand of beech trees stretches onward for nearly a league. The white wood and deep shadows are the domain of Fargus, god of beech trees. The stillness of the air is oppressive, so I don't linger for long. I stash readily available nuts in one pouch and dried leaves in another as I hurry along. This is the dream of many a druid. Red squirrels dash up and down the trees in a frenzy. Though signs of deer and elk are everywhere, they are keen to keep their distance from me. My last night in the forest is at the wood's end and only a short walk to my dun. The forest has been cleared for over a league around the great hill fort. Somehow the pasture land and fields of grain feel wrong. So much of Sir Nunes's wild lands has been taken from him. But Suselos, the god of cultivation, and the people of my dun are the claimants to this land now. The early morning sun has little warmth but it does illuminate a flock of brown-coated sheep grazing peacefully. Their wool is what is used for a druid acolyte's robe. Mine itched whenever I sweated. I won't miss it. Curious but shy, the sheep pause from their foraging, and eye me warily as I pass their enclosure. Tiny horns peek out from even the ewes. The shepherd and his dog must still be out foraging for there is no one watching the sheep. The great hill on which my dun sits emerges from the flatlands, and black, billowing smoke can be seen rising above it. Most likely Feroth and his forge are the ones polluting the air. I must trust that Boswin is right in this, like he is in most things. My feet drag me ever closer, despite my reluctance. Six concentric earthen walls climb the slopes of the hill, protecting the citizens from any invaders. Each wall is thrice the height of a man, and each ditch between them is half as deep. To enter, one must follow the walkways through the ditches to each of the offset gates. The circuitous route to the top of the hill makes it easy for only a few defenders and their slings to decimate any force foolish enough to attack. A massive wooden gate stands at the last earthen wall as a final immovable obstacle. The timber could have only come from the ancient trees of the Arden. People come and go under the watchful eye of an old gatekeeper. This will be the man who knows the town gossip, who is coming and going, and at what time. His sharp eyes no doubt give him access to secrets never voiced in the wind. He greets me with a smile that lacks several teeth. His meagre mantle gives dubious protection from the cold, and his battered cloak pin is further testament to his lowly station. The rutting season begins in another month, he says, so you should be glad that your travels led you here when they did, honoured one. It might have been preferable. I'm seeking my brother, Feroth, the blacksmith and my guess is that we will butt heads at least as hard as the rams. I knew not that Feroth had a brother. He has never spoken of family in my hearing. It seems a little harsh that even Keenal has never been acknowledged. Feroth has blamed me for mother's death since I was five, and he twelve summers old. Now that I have renounced iron, it's understandable, though not mandatory, that he dislikes me. You should hear the clanging well enough but I would recommend finding the scamp Fiegel instead. He's Feroth's stepson. You'll know him by his red hair, cropped short so that none can grab him by it. He'll be the loudest if there is a group, he says without malice. 
Could I have your name, good sir? I am Lewin, revered one. He bows his head again in deference to me. You are a credit to your town, Lewin. May your days be blessed by the gods. High praise for one as low as me. There is no sense in delaying the necessary. I enter the city. The pounding of hot iron rings out clearly, guiding me onward to my unwanted reunion. On the corner of the central square, the roiling black smoke blows into the face of the other members of the city. Opposite the forge, a wooden statue of the god Suselos sits amid harvested grains. It has been a good harvest by the offerings. My Dun's mead hall is three times the size of the one at Dinas Gwenenin, and it is but one of several. I think it best to avoid the drinking halls this time. Keep the flow even, is bellowed out between ringing strikes. I sigh. I recognise my tormentor's voice from childhood. The shop is dark and sweltering despite the cool weather. With only the glow of the charcoal visible through the smoke, I stand several paces away and wait for Feroth to notice me. He glares at me before he removes the red-hot metal from his forge. He strikes the metal with impressive force and sparks fly everywhere. Why must he always try to intimidate? Finally, he is done hammering. He places the sword into the embers until it is glowing red-hot. He grabs the blade with metal tongs and plunges it into a barrel of oil. A loud ting comes from the barrel, and my brother pulls the blade out at once. The oil on the sword ignites, and Feroth blows ferociously at the flames. He inspects the still glowing metal and throws it down in disgust. The warped sword lands on loose straw, igniting the tinder. The red-haired kid drops the bellows, grabs the incandescent metal with another set of tongs, and places the blade back atop the anvil to cool. Without a second thought, he takes off the leather apron and smothers the fire. Feroth watches in silence until the fire is out. Then he turns to face me. The forge has made my brother more chiselled. He wipes his brow and flings his sweat in my direction. You've cost me plenty of time by surprising me here. This accident will set me behind schedule. It is good to see you too, Feroth. I know better than to get defensive. Is there a better time to see you? Come to my hut shortly before nightfall. That will give us the time to say whatever needs to be said, and for you to find lodging elsewhere. Fiegel, show him our hut, then the common area, for shepherds and animals. He eyes my robes. Perhaps your uncle will deign to help bring up our sheep for the night. He walks out of the shop, making sure to drive his shoulder into me on his way out. I ball my fists, but think better of it. Boswin told me that I must conquer my own emotions before I can be a leader of men. I focus on the muscular young lad. I am your Uncle Grammy, and you must be Fiegel? Sorry about father. He got angry all at once. He didn't strike me, so it went better than I expected. Now, what do you need to do in this shop before you can show me the city? I study the boy. He can't be older than seventeen. Despite being four years younger, he's nearly as tall as I am. What must it be like, growing up with Feroth as a stand-in for his father? Feroth impregnated the old blacksmith's daughter nearly six years ago, and it was a lucky break for him. Being twenty, he never would have started so late in this profession without that accident. The shop is easy. It's the sheep that take forever, Fiegel complains. I'll help you with the shop, then you can show me the city. We'll get to the sheep last. The square is filled with market stalls, although they give the smithy a wide berth. Tanners, shamans, bakers and potters flout their wares and services. The dirt is firm underfoot, even in the low spots, so there has been no rain for nearly ten days. I sniff the air. There will be rain late tonight, 
so don't be too quick to let the sheep out tomorrow. The damp cold of the early morning can lead to sickness. How do you know that? Fiegel asks. I did not become a druid without picking up some knowledge of the weather. Father said that you would never become a druid. He said many, um, well, things about you. I shake my head. I won't speak ill of your father, but this is not surprising to me. He's not my real father, so I won't take offence, he assures me. Already, the flat, grassless plaza makes me uncomfortable. Is there any more of the city worth seeing? Only the brothels. Do you have a favourite lady there? His face turns as red as his hair. I chuckle at his discomfort. I have no need to see the brothels. Follow me, and I will show you what it's like to walk with nature. We pass Lewin at the gate, and climb to the topmost earthen wall. I bid Fiegel to point to the field with his sheep. One by one, I compel the sheep to hop the woven willow fence, and make their way up the windy path and through the gates. The youth shepherding the sheep in the field looks on in awe. Once they arrive, I have them follow Fiegel to my brother's pen. Fiegel laughs in delight. At least I have some family happy to see me. We return to the central plaza as the other children are struggling to lead their livestock to the pens. When are you expected to return home? I ask. Dinner is not for a little bit. Father asked you to visit after then, so you will have to find your own. It was not unexpected. Who in this city is still attuned to the old ways? Isla is the one to see. She and her ladies will be happy to see you. She may even ask you to stay with her through the night. You seem to know a lot about the brothels, I say, to make him blush again. A simple meal is all I seek. I will lodge somewhere else. Fiegel leads me to Isla's place. The ladies begin their catcalls of poor Fiegel. He and his very red face leave me almost at once. I ask for only a simple meal, as is my due, and give honest thanks. Metal is anathema to druids, so I have no coin for her other services. It's early yet, so the women aren't busy. I speak with them about the town gossip until the disc of Belenos is low in the sky. I wrap up the loaf of fresh bread and bid Isla and her ladies a good evening. There is no sense delaying my visit any longer. The door to his home is open. Good evening, brother, I say as I approach. His wife greets me. I am Conwenna. In my country, the door is left open when guests are expected. It is an invitation for friends to enter. My sister-in-law is nearing the end of childbearing age. Despite this, only a few shallow worry lines are etched on her otherwise smooth face. Conwenna, you are as gracious as a hostess could be. I kiss her on the cheek before she escorts me inside. There are three small girls sitting quietly on a heavy blanket near the fire. The youngest two are avid crawlers. The oldest of the girls must be about five. She throws a finely wrought bone comb at me. A small piece breaks loose. The white orb has subtle streaks of colour flitting across it as it catches the light. Is this an oyster rock? I ask. I have never seen one before. It is, Conwenna says, as she quickly takes the fine stone from me. She turns to her daughter. Berga, I told you not to touch my comb. But I want to be beautiful like you, her daughter says in a petulant voice. I grin foolishly at the girls. Why are you here? Feroth demands. So much for getting to know my nieces. I straighten up and ready myself for what's to come. I have been sent on a quest by my mentor, and he has insisted that I see my family in case it ends badly for me. Why did I say that? I know better than to expect sympathy from Feroth. I'm not buying it. What do you want? Feroth, give him a chance, please, his wife urges. She goes to his side and gently rubs his back. He scowls at her 
before facing me again. Conwenna doesn't know you as I do. You have the prettiest blue eyes, she says, interrupting her husband. They are so bright, I can get lost in them. Thank you. They are like our mothers, or so I've been told. Feroth slams his drink down. Conwenna deftly changes the topic. Where does this quest take you? My next stop is Solent Keep. I know not where I will go after that. The Sorim are in charge now, and they don't like your kind, Feroth says, smiling maliciously. They are an enlightened folk. I aim to go there, nonetheless. No matter what trouble you cause, I will not come to your aid. I wouldn't want you to do that, dear brother. This quest is for me to accomplish alone. Speaking to Feroth just makes me weary. Then this is goodbye, perhaps for the final time, he asks, hopefully. Feroth, he's your brother, Conwenna scolds. Don't go wishing ill fate upon him. I could have told her it's no use. His head is as hard as his anvil. I did not come to fight or to beg. I came simply because I will become a druid, and I don't know when I may see you again. The only request I will make of you is to share news of the road to Solent Keep, if you have any. I keep any hint of disappointment out of my voice. I would have liked to have gotten to know my nieces and nephew, but that is obviously not going to happen. The road is fine since the coming of the Obsidian Mage. He's cleared out the petty brigands, and now anyone can travel the road without fear of assault. He has been a blessing for the surrounding area. The Obsidian Order has invaded our lands and enslaved our people with their mind control, I say, with more heat than I expected. You would trade safe roads for thousands of our people becoming slaves to a foreign power? Who exactly are our people? Do they include the cutthroats who preyed on innocent travellers? Feroth asks. Do they include the hardly civilised ciliars, ordifices or atribates? The Obsidian Lord can take over all of the Southern Pratani for all I care. He has been hiring out all the blacksmiths he can find to make quality swords and axe heads. With luck, he'll rule the entire South within a few years. I don't even try to hide my revulsion. Disagreeableness I expect from Feroth, but never did I think he would abandon the land and set his lot with a soulless invader. Can I go with Uncle Grammy? Figol asks. I can show him the way to the city. You're needed in the smithy, Feroth says, quashing his son's excitement. Conwenna hugs my brother and leans her head on his shoulder. We could get by for a day, don't you think? She casts her deep brown eyes up at Feroth. He's performed well as your apprentice. You said so yourself at supper yesterday. My brother gazes into his wife's eyes, as if enchanted. Figo can escort my brother far away from here, for all I care. He points his finger at his son. As long as you're back before nightfall. Figo is giddy in his thanks. Oddly, no one has bothered me for my opinion on the matter. I could flatly refuse and throw it back in my brother's face, but then I would be injuring my nephew as well. Find me at sunrise, Fiegel. I will be staying with someone who still respects the old ways. Feroth finds mirth in my statement. It would be like him to try to bait me into a fight. Few could contend with his impressive strength. I have slowly been learning your ways, Conwenna says. Were all of you raised with this devotion? It was Mother who instilled it in us. Feroth goes rigid and glares at me with hatred in his eyes. I'm going to the mead hall. He makes straight for the door. I retreat a few steps out of his way and let the angry fool pass. Goodbye, brother, I say to his back. I tried. I even managed to keep myself calm and not rise to my brother's barbs. Fiegel, watch your sisters. I wish to show Grammy our fair city. She extends her arm and I clasp it gently. Once clear of the house, she guides us to the statue of Sucellos in the central plaza. 
You will take Figol with you tomorrow, won't you? He is not cut out to be a bladesmith, and he never gets to leave this city. I would welcome his company, even if only for a short time. Conwenna relaxes, now that her son has a chance to leave. I have to be sure you really mean this, and you aren't just agreeing to aggravate your brother. Your son will be welcome to join me. I don't know my sister-in-law at all, and I'm afraid I might be overstepping, but I can't remain quiet. Would it be possible for Figol to go to his real father? No, she says quickly. That is not an option. She glances sideways, toward the hall. We shouldn't linger here. Silly men may start wagging their tongues about us, even though we are in the middle of the town. I don't envy her dealing with the angry drunk that Feroth is no doubt on his way to becoming tonight. We slowly stroll back to the house. Don't worry about your brother, she says. I can handle him. I only took us out of the house in case you were to refuse Fiegel's company. He would have been crushed had you said no. Are you sure you and the children will be safe tonight? She waves away my concerns. Feroth is tired these days. The obsidian mage keeps all the blacksmiths of the area very busy. I nod slightly to show I understand her warning. The nine will have to be made aware of this at once. The obsidian mage is preparing for war. You don't need to make apologies. He is my kin, and I know him too well to be surprised. Back at their door, I nod. Good night, Conwenna. Please she says as she grabs my hand. She reaches inside the door and hands me a loaf of bread and a small leather bag that jingles in her hand. I ask that you take this, if not from him, then from me. The bread I will gladly accept, my lady, but not your coin. Metal is distasteful to druids, and that is one of the many reasons why Feroth and I will never be close. Please take it, Grammy. You will need it when you enter the city. It is little enough, and it will keep you from drawing suspicion. She places her hand tentatively on my arm, and my resolve fails me at once. She slips the small bag of coins into my hand and presses my fingers closed. My family comes from the Innis Luco, so I can sense that you are looking for trouble in the city. The mage's power is among the greatest of my people. You must avoid his attention at all cost. Her big, earnest eyes stop my protestations before I can even make them. I wish you success, she whispers. Leaving my brother's house, I feel as if his wife and I had shared a moment as intimate as any I have experienced. My desire to gloat is instantly met with shame. I don't know what it is about Conwenna, but she makes me feel like raw dough in her hands. She could stretch, knead, or not my will in any way she desires. I shake my head to clear it of the confusing, but not unpleasant, experience.